This month, we're asking for your support through our premium programs via the Escapist Plus and YouTube memberships. Your support allows us to continue making the content we want instead of chasing algorithms or the latest trends. Plus, you get a bunch of perks like ad-free viewing via the Escapist Plus on our main website, early access on YouTube via YouTube memberships, and bonus content like our monthly Ask the Creators video series where we answer your burning questions. Thanks in advance for your continued support. It genuinely means the world to us. When The Expanse launched in 2015, it was heavily sold as Game of Thrones in space, with a comparison even attributed to industry insiders before the premiere. That comparison makes sense, particularly in the world of peak TV, where it's easier to sell a new concept as some X meets Y combination of recognizable and marketable brand elements. Think Batman meets Taxi Driver, or think Training Day meets Terminator 2, but with the aesthetic of a canon films project. Or your beloved childhood science fiction franchise meets the crushing demands of reality. Given that so much of modern television production has been defined by the search for the next Game of Thrones, the comparison is certainly an appealing one. However, it also provides an interesting lens through which to examine The Expanse. What makes it similar to Game of Thrones? What makes it different? And what does that say about each? Even beyond the basic concept of a deconstructionist epic, The Expanse seemed destined to be compared to Game of Thrones. Ty Frank, who co-wrote The Expanse novels with Daniel Abram under the pen name S.A. Corey, famously worked as an assistant to Song of Ice and Fire author G. Orr Martin. For his part, Martin provided the books with enthusiastic pull quotes that seemed to invite comparisons to his own epic work. However, the comparisons run deeper than those on the cover. This is obvious even just looking at the first books and seasons in each saga. Both Game of Thrones and The Expanse open with a decoy protagonist, played by the most recognizable name in the cast. Game of Thrones had Sean Bean playing Eddard Ned Stark, while The Expanse cast Thomas Jane as Detective Joe Miller. Both The Expanse and Game of Thrones cleverly play with genre, casting these characters as detectives, unraveling a mystery that organically introduces the audience into these fantastical worlds. Neither protagonist would make it out of the series' first act alive. Ned's death towards the end of the first season of Game of Thrones was a game-changing moment for television that arguably inspired years of pale imitation. Miller's departure midway through the second season of The Expanse is less radical because it exists in the wake of Ned's death, but it serves a similar purpose of bidding farewell to the biggest star in the cast so that the ensemble can prosper as a whole. Game of Thrones and The Expanse are similarly structured, featuring a large cast spread across a vast geographic area. It's this feature that distinguishes The Expanse from earlier breakout science fiction shows like the Star Trek spin-offs or Battlestar Galactica. While shows like Deep Space Nine or Battlestar Galactica would occasionally split up the cast for epic multi-episode stories, these were the exception rather than the rule. In contrast, cast separation in The Expanse is the norm. This is most obvious in the recent fifth season, which splits the crew of the Rossi across four plot threads. Even the fourth season divided the crew, with James Holden and Amos Burton on the surface of Illus, while Naomi Nagata and Alex Kamal are stuck in orbit. Characters are often absent for episodes or stretches at a time. Christian Avasarala barely appears in the second half of the third season. And the aptly named Sir not appearing in this film. The Expanse regularly follows story threads scattered across the gulf of space. The early seasons had separate threads organized around the powers of Earth, Mars, and the Belt. The fourth season expands the action to New Terra, a planet in a different solar system, while also cutting between an election on Earth, hints of social decay on Mars, and scheming among the tribes of the Belt. As with Game of Thrones, even the opening credits of The Expanse are a helpful geography and history lesson. While these overlaps speak to the evolution of series production, spurred by Game of Thrones pushing the boundaries of what was possible on television, they also hint at a larger thematic resonance between The Expanse and Game of Thrones. This common structure is more than just a way of suggesting scale and scope. The deliberately fragmented ensembles and geographies of Game of Thrones and The Expanse suggest characters only seeing pieces of a much greater whole. Both Game of Thrones and The Expanse are stories about mankind confronted by larger external threats, struggling to cohere in the face of extinction. Game of Thrones and The Expanse introduce these existential threats in their opening scenes, the horror of the White Walkers and the nightmare of the Proto-Molecule. The Expanse even develops this idea further, suggesting that the real threat is the unseen alien menace that destroyed the society that created the Proto-Molecule. In that sense, both Game of Thrones and The Expanse are products of the same cultural moment. 
Both Game of Thrones and The Expanse mock the absurdity of factual infighting when confronted with the apocalypse. When dead men, and worse, come hunting for us in the night, do you think it matters who sits on the Iron Throne? Earth, Mars, the Belt, the OPA. It's all bullshit. There shouldn't be any teams. However, The Expanse differs from Game of Thrones in a number of important ways, which suggests that Frank and Abram have learned from the challenges that faced Martin in finishing his epic saga. Or, you know, not finishing his epic saga. In contrast, the last book of The Expanse is due this year. Notably, the big arcs in The Expanse tend to tidy up after themselves rather than expanding infinitely outwards like the fractal plotting of Game of Thrones. Obviously, each arc of The Expanse feeds directly to the next in a logical manner. However, the series is willing to wrap up plot threads as it goes, treating them as finite concerns. To illustrate this point, we mentioned briefly how both Game of Thrones and The Expanse open with mysteries. It's notable that Game of Thrones takes four seasons to resolve the central mystery of who murdered Jon Arryn. When it turns out, eh, Littlefinger did it, sure why not, let's go with that. In contrast, The Expanse wraps up its mystery plotline before the end of its first season. The protomolecule hybrids drove much of the first two and a half seasons of The Expanse, but are no longer a driving force. Illus dominated the fourth season, but that plot is now resolved. Frank and Abram employed a 30-year time jump between the 6th and 7th books in their series, as a way of getting everything lined up as one big plot arc coming to the finale. In contrast, Martin had considered, but eventually decided against, a 5-year time jump before a feast for crows. Naturally, a time jump like that would allow for a lot of the narrative logistics necessary for lining up an endgame to occur off-page and off-screen. Even Boardwalk Empire used such a jump in its final season to help it get across the finish line. Martin has talked about the challenges of lining up characters and events, referring to the difficulty of getting characters to the right places at the right times as the Marinese Knot. As A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones grew ever outward and more complex, the challenges of aligning those characters and those plot threads became increasingly difficult. Martin has spent years trying to resolve these problems, while the television series did not have that luxury. And let's just say they had to fudge it a bit. We need to find Euron Greyjoy's fleet and sink it. Euron ships could be anywhere or in more than one place. The Golden Company has arrived in King's Landing courtesy of the Greyjoy fleet. While Danny kind of forgot about the Iron Fleet and Euron's forces. As an illustration of this, Consider how much internet ink was spent exploring the fact that characters seemed to magically teleport across the final season of Game of Thrones, as the chronology struggled to line up and account for everything. The Expanse learned a lot from Game of Thrones, importing a lot of the more interesting and radical ideas from that game-changing series. However, The Expanse also seems to have learned from the challenges facing Game of Thrones, and adjusted accordingly. The Expanse is a much neater and a much less sprawling series, Martin famously described his writing style as that of a gardener rather than an architect. If that's the case, Frank and Abram seem to be much happier using a hedge trimmer. This all suggests a series aiming for a more comfortable endgame than that of Game of Thrones. Of course, The Expanse is reportedly ending after adapting only six of the books. While Frank has described this as a very natural pause point, it seems likely that the ending of The Expanse might prove just as frustrating to book fans as that of Game of Thrones just for a slightly different reason. If Game of Thrones had provided an ending that the books had yet denied, The Expanse may be denied an ending that the books already landed. I've been Darren Mooney, and this was In The Frame.